Hello, everybody. This is Chris Callahan at University of Vermont Extension Agricultural Engineering. Uh, excited to be with you today and to talk about the design of exclusion netting support systems to provide long-term control of SWD, Spotlight Drosophila, and maximum utility for berry farmers. What we're going to be talking about today is a uh, the result of long and dedicated um, series of projects that uh, really have been led by Dale Isla Riggs and uh, the Berry Patch in Steventown, New York. I've uh, been fortunate to become a part of that re project recently and to work with Dale Isla over the past few years thinking through how to support this exclusion netting um, that is really demonstrating some great results uh, in terms of effectiveness for keeping SWD out of the plantings. Uh, as you can see in the in the photo there, this is uh, a blueberry planting. Um, but uh, Dale Isla has also uh, used this on used this product on uh, high tunnels for uh, late raspberries as well. I do want to make a uh, just acknowledge the the, te the rest of the team that's been involved in this project. So I, I mentioned Dale Isla Riggs, who really has she is the the, the PI on the currently funded SARE project and has really uh, shepherded the project and the idea from from day one. Um, Dale Isla's uh, partner Don Miles and um, uh, uh, farm, farm uh, laborer uh, Greg Blanchett also at the Berry Patch uh, have been critically in, uh, important to the project and making things happen. Um, we've been also uh, partnering with uh, Greg Loeb and Steve uh, Hessler from uh, Cornell Agritech, Laura McDermott and Natasha Field uh, co from Cornell Cooperative Extension Eastern New York. And um, this in this past year, and actually in, in previous years, have had great support from Paul Lucas at Gentech Shade Technologies, who really specializes in these uh, post and wire structures, and uh, also Ted Storzum from Technet Industries, who are uh, the, the company currently making this netting that we've been using. So a little bit about SWD exclusion netting. The, the intent here is to exclude the, the pest in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, spotted wing Drosophila that you can see male and female um, examples there. It's a, a small fruit fly, uh, about one millimeter by two and a half millimeters, um, and the the motivation is to replace spraying as a um, as a, a, a mitigation for these uh, pests. Um, spraying has uh, Dale Dale Isla has noted spraying be to be uh, um, prohibitively expensive, uh, labor intense, and and not terribly effective. And so the thought was, what else? What else can we do? Uh, and importantly, to do something that's a relatively passive exclusion measure—you know, reduce the labor required and uh, the number of applications. And so, uh, netting was was the idea. Um, Dale Isle has done uh, a, a series of SARE funded projects um, to with a, a variety of designs, starting with some some simple hoops, um, and then moving into some post and wire. Uh, prototypes uh, two years ago and in this past year moving to a purpose purposely designed and, and built uh, post and wire system with a lot of help from uh, Gentech. Um, our, our findings so far are really demonstrating very strong economic payback in Delilah's case it's it points to about a half a year payback based on uh, her um, her markets which are a mix of wholesale retail and pick your own um, so what we aim to do with the current project, which is actually two projects, um, we have one uh, Northeast Sarah Farmer project, um, and and then it, we've combined efforts with uh, New York State Department of Ag and Market Specialty Crop Block Grant for some additional demonstration sites in Western New York, which I'll talk a little bit about later on. What we're trying to do is really understand the capital and labor investment, uh, which we we understand is a, is a barrier to adoption uh, for this for this measure. Um, and so we wanted to be able to test document design, test and document designs that would improve growers' confidence that uh, you know I I can do this and it'll work. Um, we wanted better budget information. We wanted to work on improving durability of both the netting and the structure, and then we needed to work on improved winter management for the netting. So um, you know these the, the netting is typically only used during the, the ripe harvest season. This is an overhead shot of the most recent incarnation of SWD netting at uh, Dale Isla's uh, 
farm, the Berry Patch in Steventown, New York. You can see that the planting uh, is it's approximately half an acre, and it's nestled between a series of greenhouses and high tunnels. That's a raspberry tunnel on the on the right hand side. Um, the oh yeah, I should say something about the netting. Um, so we talked about the size of SWD, and so the openings in this netting are are designed to be small enough to to exclude them. That's it's it's really is that straightforward. Uh, keep the opening smaller than the pest you're trying to keep out, and uh, you might be able to keep them out. On the left hand side is an 80 gram netting, and, and netting is um, sized in grams. It's uh, um, and what that translates to is the essentially the open area. It's the amount of amount of solid material in the netting, um, and then on the right hand side is just showing a sort of a new development in the past uh, two years, which is to include a rip stop type um, design. It's a cross knit going in the other direction. Uh, one of the things we found in the past couple of years is a little bit of wear and abrasion can create a, a small hole that turns into a large hole, and it goes right down the seam. And so this is a an idea that uh, Dale Isla and uh, TechNet had, had worked on the past couple of years to improve the durability of the product. So I mentioned it's a half acre uh, blueberry bush planting, 19 years old, uh, so these are quite uh, quite mature uh, plants. Um, this particular planting is 80 by 270 feet. And what we did um, for this demonstration was work closely with uh, Gintech to come up with a demonstration of two post types uh, to be used in a post and wire structure. Sort of a traditional wooden post on the left hand side you can see th those are marked with yellow dots and you can see a picture in the upper left hand corner. Um, and <clears throat> right here, here's the, the wooden post. Um, and the uh, on the right hand side with the red dots are steel posts and I'll zoom in a little bit here so you can see those steel posts and those the wooden posts go right into a, an auger hole the steel posts go on a uh, an anchor that's that's driven into the ground and we'll, we'll show pictures of those which are right here uh, these are the the earth uh, earth anchors um, and you can see they have an eyelid on the top uh, th some of them have a flange uh, for the post to sit on and then they have a, a sweep, a helical sweep at the bottom that that brings them into the ground especially if you don't have rocks which we'll talk about. Um, the spacing as you can see is uh, 15 feet between posts in the long direction, 20 feet in the short direction. Um, there are perimeter anchors as well noted uh, with the orange dots and the um, and then we have zippered panels that's another development this in the the most recent build you can see there are six panels total, and in between those panels are these zippers. And the idea is to ease the the deployment in the summer and the um, re, uh, the, the storing in the in the winter. So these panels come apart with the zippers, you push them over to one side, and they get stored on the wire for the winter uh, in a bundle wrapped in UV um, UV resistant plastic. Um, the, the cable we're using is quarter-inch, seven-strand aircraft cable. A lot of the design um, of this system comes from the wealth of experience that Gentech has making shade structures for uh, lots of environments with uh, high winds and different weather. And, um, it's, uh, it's, it's quite durable so far. Uh, this is what it looks like from basically inside. This is just before we, we zipped things up. You can see the um, wooden posts on about a third of the planting here and steel posts in the far far view of this photo. Um, you can see the cables. They run basically crisscross. It's sort of a quilting type uh, style or a woven style. Um, and then the, um, the, uh, the netting goes, the netting panels go on, on top of that. And it are, are secured with something called currently something called a hog ring, which is a, um, a semi-permanent steel clip. Uh, we are actually looking into making that a little less permanent, maybe using something like carabiners or snap rings uh, or snap snap clips to make the um, attachment and detachment easier. This view also gives you a sense for the maturity of the the plants, uh, the blueberry plants we're we're talking about here. Um, so a lot of this work comes down to um, 
digging holes or driving anchors and um, the, the ground is, at Dale Isla's place is it's not terribly um, not terribly rocky but it was turns out it was rocky enough to be a bit of a, a hindrance for the work we were doing um, even you know rocks and stones the size of your hand really can can cause uh, some some frustration when you're trying to use earth augers and one of the reasons we use these manual systems these, these sort of one and two person systems or try to is because it's it's an existing planting and so getting something in there uh pto driven or tractor mounted is, is pretty challenging um what we found was the um they, these are called one and two person earth augers the one person earth auger when you're trying to go into rocky relatively rocky soil really is a two person auger you need two people to do that safely and, and effectively um, and the two-person auger, uh, we found at least the, the one we had, which had a bit of a throttle issue and uh, wasn't terribly uh, stable, we just found was not worth the time. Uh, you, so using a, a one-person auger with two people, uh, high, much more effective than a two-person auger. Um, the the real thing, uh, two two big thing, two big lessons we learned was weld up a, a custom adapter for setting the earth anchors. So this is a an, a an adapter that was welded to go over the hex drive output of an earth auger on one end. So on the left side that goes over the hex drive output, and on the right side that view is showing the how the adapter goes over the the top of the earth anchors. Um, the other, I'll show, we'll show you how that attaches in a second. The other big lesson learned was this thing. It's called a groundhog, and it's a, you can see it's a wheeled um, earth auger. This uh, still ideally run by two people just for safety and stability, but boy, does this make the work a lot easier in an existing planting uh, if you can't get a tractor-mounted uh, tool in there. Uh, you can see it's self-powered. Uh, you move it around like a wheelbarrow. Um, it's pretty pretty darn mobile and agile and um, does does a great job and you can see how that adapter goes on the hex output um, and we'll have plans for this available on the project website but you know uh, either a, a good welder on the on the farm or a, a metal shop nearby it's a easy job for the right person so you can see how uh, the groundhog was used to drive the earth anchors here. Just slips over the top, the eyelet pretty easily. Just a loose fitting doesn't need to be secured terribly well. Uh, the pressure you're using to push it down is is, is sufficient to keep it keep it in place. Typically, a uh, little bit of nuance. And you can see one of the earth anchors in the upper right hand corner as it was installed. Um, and so this is you can see the blueberry bushes in the in the background here. The um, and this would this earth anchor in particular because it has that flange would would get a steel post on top of it that's part of the the netting structure support um, another view of the posts and how the posts and wire come together you can see here that you know we have wood posts and then steel posts in the far on the far right side the wire you can see coming through the steel posts and and through the wood posts on the perimeter, they go they go along the side of the the posts in on the interior posts. Um, here's a view down the line of the wood and steel posts, and an, and a, a glimpse of how the wire is tightened, how tension, how we create tension in the wire. We use something called a uh, series of cable winches on the on the far side. There's a uh, um, a cable winch that's attached to that far post to keep it plumb. On this side, we have a second winch attached to this post to keep it plumb, and then the third winch, uh, cable winch, is used to tighten the, the the cable. You need to keep the two end posts plumb, and then tighten the cable. As you tighten the cable, the it, the, the tension is going to want to pull those posts in. So that's why you need three cable winches. Uh, very grateful to Gintech for walking us through this method, which um, is easier than it sounds. Um, so what it, what were the results and what what did we what did we learn? Uh, the the main thing was that um, is a, you know sort of the continuation of what Dale Isla has demonstrated previously in in this in this farm research that exclusion netting works very well, especially if you can uh, close up all the seams, uh, use a good vestibule. So if you're uh, you know a, a basically a double door entry, um, double netted door entry going into the space to to really provide that extra level of exclusion. 
keep a close eye on any rips and uh, openings and holes you might have and, and, and close them up. We're, we're doing a little bit of work right now looking at different methods of doing that, Gorilla Tape and uh, sewing and, and different types of tape and, and glues and things like that for, for maintenance, which, which is, is necessary. Uh, you can see the difference here that um, in some of the infest infestation data that Delilah has, has had. In this past year, I was just looking through the data. It's um, actually less than 0.25% <coughs> less than 0.25% in 2020 infestation. So, and then the other question we often get is, what about wind, rain, and hail? The site in uh, the, the, at the Berry Patch, it's, it's in a valley um, near the Taconics and Berkshire Mountains, and it sees fairly high winds and hail events. In fact, there was a significant hail event uh, this past summer, which um, had hail standing on this netting and, and drooping it down for almost 24 hours, and um, no signs of, of uh, sustained damage. And uh, winds, I think, up to uh, 60 miles an hour, and uh, that might even be, be low. I, I, I think Dale, I mentioned it was even higher. So keeps the, keeps the flies out, keeps the SWD out, and uh, holds up to the weather uh, events. At what cost? And this was really kind of the, the, the real exciting data to, to get a handle on this year. We, we tracked our labor, um, and for, for, the, for all you growers, this is, this is labor of, um, you know, among a mix of, um, you know, skilled and less skilled laborers uh, doing the construction. And there are a couple of uh, university uh, researchers and extension folks involved. So um, make of that what you will. But uh, we did keep track of the hours. And uh, this was done by people who had never really built one of these structures before. Um, the netting is the netting. Um, and that's that cost is common, whether you do wood or steel. And then the structure, uh, the material uh, costs for the structure here are as if the whole um, the whole half acre was done in that in that material so um and you can see at the, at the end of the day it's about uh between you know twenty five thousand dollars per acre for wood to twenty eight thousand dollars per acre for steel um the the difference between the two is steel is a fair bit easier to install uh you can see the the labor difference uh between the two um i think that the difference might even be more significant if you're doing a larger uh, planting um, steels are just a bit easier to install, and there are some concerns over um, durability of wood. Although, um, you know, we, there are plenty of examples where where these uh, PT posts have have lasted for quite a while. Um, and, and then we have per square foot costs as well. Um, so, by f just for frame of reference, there are also this is this is for this post and wire system, but uh, there are a number of others more more. Uh, Bootstrap or do-it-yourself uh, approaches using greenhouse hoops or uh, EMT conduit, uh, things like that, are that are you know still about the same cost per square foot, ha uh, half a dollar, so fifty cents, or so fifty cents, or uh, maybe forty cents, forty-five cents per square foot. Uh, what's what's coming? So one thing we're doing right now is we are doing our best to document what we learned and make it easier for for growers to understand what's involved in building one of these systems and to 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 decide um, whether it works for them or not. Uh, we have a series of um, photo and video guides planned uh, to 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 make it easier to get get acquainted with the with with the the materials and how they come together. Um, we have a Western New York, at least one Western New York demonstration site planned for the coming year where we will, so we're doing another build um, of at, at least one, maybe two, I believe. Um, a series of workshops and presentations like this one. We are also trying to pull together a design guide both in print and photo and video format to, to really, again, make this easier for everybody to get familiar with. Uh, those are the costs there. And the other good news is uh, that this is something that currently is supported by NRCS cost share, although uh, Dale Isla mentioned to me that the the cost, uh, sorry, the the uh, the cost share is relatively low currently um, as part of this project and also as a result of Dale Isla's work over the past couple of years. Um, the the current cost share is being is being reviewed, and uh, we hope it it can be brought up to be more more realistic to support the measure. Um, it, and I think with that, we'll move into questions and I'm, I'm hoping Dale Isla's on, 
on the line as well uh, and can help answer some of the uh, some of the questions that I, I, I don't have.